Hi guys, welcome all to the Function Tennis webinar. Thank you for joining us. This is our second webinar. I'm very excited to have Nikki Rowan from Unstrung Customs on board. Uh, Nikki is a great guy, great stringer, a great tennis player. And yeah, most importantly, he knows a lot about strings and rackets. He's worked with pros such as Djokovic, Murray. He's looked after their rackets and many countless other pro tennis players. And he also does a great job painting rackets also. I'm not sure if we're going to talk about that today, but we can find out more about it anyway. So I'm just going to let Nikki introduce himself. Before we do that, just say we have Keen, our moderator here. He'd be asking the questions at the end. So we're just going to let Nikki do his webinar and people can leave their questions in the chat function and then we'll ask them afterwards. And that is that. So Nikki, I'm going to leave it all to you and we're going to get, we're going to jump off here. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, so, hello everybody. Um, my name is Nikki Rowan from Unstrung Customs. And uh, today, yeah, Fabio's um, invited me along to, uh, to kind of go over and um, to share with you guys some of my knowledge about um, tennis strings and rackets. Um, as he did say, we also paint rackets, um, but we're going to kind of leave that section maybe for a later date. So today we're going to be focusing on understanding uh, strings and rackets a little bit better. So I'm going to try and uh, share this my screen. Uh, sorry about that. So we're going to get straight back into things. So um, yeah, so like I said, we're going to talk about understanding strings and rackets today. So I'm kind of going to go over the kind of main different types of strings, how they're made, what their differences are, um, what kind of tensions, uh, what differences are in different tensions in different gauges, uh, and kind of hopefully give you guys a better all-round understanding. Um, bear in mind, obviously, with stuff, something like strings especially, there are so many different types and so many different varieties that I will be generalizing slightly. Um, so I'll obviously kind of take what I say with a slight pinch of salt um, and then perhaps uh, apply that to how you sort of might best need that information because um yeah uh, as you'll see I'll, um there's you know there's just so much information on strings um but i'm gonna gonna try and condense it all in and uh, hopefully give you guys a really good overview then after that i'm gonna speak about uh rackets again same thing i'm gonna go over how they're made um and what the different kind of aspects of a frame are and then a little bit into customizing and what kind of small little changes we can do with customizing that you guys might find interesting or beneficial for your tennis. So uh, first of all, I'm gonna to talk to you about the three sort of main different types of strings. Like I said, there are a couple of others. Um, however, these are kind of the most important ones, the most prominent ones. Um, as you can see, first of all, we have a monofilament polyester. Uh, then we have a multifilament polyester, which I've kind of put together with synthetic gut. And then we have a uh, natural gut. So for those of you that don't know, the monofilament polyester is made up of, um, filaments of uh, pellets of polyester uh, which are added to like a big hopper um, with and all these pe different pellets can are going to determine the outcome of the string so some will be for color some for durability playability uh, stiffness stuff like that um, and then all these pellets are melted down and then they are single extruded into your one piece of string that could be round it could be octagonal however you want the shape of the string to be but it's going to be extruded in one long piece and then we have our multifilament polyester string, um, which is the first one you can see there in the yellow, um, which is hundreds or even thousands of little um, braided pieces of, um, can either be nylon, can be polymers, um, which are then woven and braided together. And then they are coated in a um, polymer coating to give it a little bit better durability. Um, and then in the same kind of bracket type of string, we have a synthetic gut string, which the main difference between a multifilament and a synthetic gut string is that, multi, uh, that synthetic guts nearly always have um, a core, a center core, which is what you can see there in the green string. Um, and that center core is made the same way kind of a monofilament um, polyester is made. And then it's then um, braided with the fibers on top and then coated. So that core there, I'll talk a little bit more about later, but it's basically there to help with um, tension. Uh, hold and uh, durability as well. Uh, and then of course we have our natural gut string, which is um, obviously very well known. It's, uh, it's made from cows in general or cattle in general. And it's made from the part of, um, of the intestine called the serosa, the serosa membrane. 
uh, and that membrane is then stretched out um, and woven into into string, which is why obviously natural gut has um, a uh, a very high price because of the labour intensive job um, that's needed to uh, to make the string. And uh, they actually, as far as I'm aware, they only take cows from a couple of places in the world that have the right environment um, in order to make um, the gut nece necessary for string. So as there might be a few others now, but generally most gut is either made in uh, France or the cows come from France, uh, New Zealand, um, and I think as well there are a few in Canada. But um, yeah, they need a specific diet with regards to weather and stuff in order to make, um, in order to have a gut that is, that is you know, usable for uh, the tennis string. I'll get a little bit more into that, what that means in a bit. So as you can see, I've kind of made a little uh, graph that kind of, again, this is a generalization um but just to give you guys obviously a, like a, a basic idea that you have your monofilament polyesters which are generally very stiff um, and then kind of as you go across mon multifilament synthetic and synthetic guts they get slightly more elastic um, in general obviously stiffness means more control and uh, elasticity means more power again i'm going to get into a little bit more detail in a minute um, so for monofilament polyesters, like I said, they are generally generalized as being a stiffer string. Um, so what that means is that when you impact, when they get impacted, they don't move as much as, for example, a natural gut might. Um, and then natural gut, like I said, is very elastic. And one of the big strengths of natural gut is the collagen that's in the gut, uh, which is the same collagen that we have in the uh, in our skin. Um, and that's what really allows the natural gut to be so elastic um, and so the elasticity basically means that is the ability of uh, of the string to be hit and return back to its original shape time and time again uh, which is why uh, natural gut is still so popular that um, again I'm going to come into tension a, bit, a little bit later on but there are kind of some properties that allow it to hold tension very well and uh, which is what makes it so popular um, so now Again, coming into tension, um, just a little comparison between the uh, between, for example, the polyester string and the natural gut string. Um, as we can see, the uh, natural gut say they're sort of strung at roughly the same tension. Um, you can see that in within the first 12 hours, natural gut loses a little bit, then it evens off. After about 24 hours, it barely loses any tension um, over the course of time. Um, Whereas compared to, for example, polyester, in the first 10 minutes, it's already dropped, um, you know, 5% 5, 5 in, um, in tension. And then again, it kind of levels out after the first 12 hours for a little bit, then it has a very big drop again. Uh, and then it just gradually loses tension over time. So uh, that's kind of one of the main, uh, I think, misconceptions between uh, a natural gut and a polyester string is that natural gut is actually very good at holding tension um, over a long time, over a long period. Uh, whereas polyester, it just um, as soon as you strung it, it's just continuously losing um, wow. losing tension. Yeah. So um, so and obviously multifilament is then somewhere in between. So for example, multifilament uh, which doesn't have the center core is going to be slightly closer to our natural gut because um, of all the braided fibers that are made. Um, obviously, as you as you keep playing, those fibers. Uh, are going to sort of come slightly apart. They're going to open up. You might have seen your um, different multifilaments like uh, X1, Technofib X1 biphase. The more you play, they kind of become frayed. And that's simply those fibers that start to kind of open up uh, and then they will, they will break. Um, the same with a synthetic gut is going to be slightly closer to the polyester because it has that center core. Um, so basically what that center core does, obviously it gives that string strength uh, it helps with the uh, durability of the string um, because of that and also but it will then lose tension um, a little bit faster um, so they're kind of the like a few basic sort of differences between the strings that perhaps people people often expect natural gut to break very quickly uh, or to lose tension um, because it's kind of known you know because it is expensive people you know think that it's delicate um, However, for some players, it actually could be a good investment, um, especially in my opinion, in sort of, let's say the older generation or those that have some arm problems because, uh, okay, it might be more per restring, but you may need less restrings and it might actually help your game. It might also help your joints and your body. So um, people kind of 
a little bit scared, I think, of natural gut also because it is a little bit more difficult to string in terms of um, we have to be a little bit more delicate and so on. However, um, it is always something worth considering. Um, and then obviously within um, polyesters, there are so many different types of monofilament polyester strings. Uh, you have super stiff ones, you have softer ones, uh, rough ones. And they're just, like I said, there's just, it depends on the mixture of pellets that are added to the hopper that will give you the different, um, uh, the different properties of the string. Um, and actually nowadays, a lot of the big companies are putting a lot of time and effort into developing softer polyester strings. Um, because after, over the last few years, polyester has become, uh, monofilaments become very popular, um, especially with juniors and stuff, because obviously it's what a lot, all the pros are using. However, it's not always the best for either their gameplay or their body. Uh, whereas now there's been become a bit of a demand or a trend, let's say, of softer um, polyesters coming into the market. So let's say ones that are kind of, uh, I would call them transition polyesters that take you from, you know, using a multifilament or a natural uh, synthetic gut into like a full firm polyester setup, uh, monofilament setup like uh, Alu Power or RPM, which are they're amazing strings, uh, they're just not right for everybody, and that's what people kind of forget sometimes. Um, you know that the and I'll get onto that with rackets as well. That the that just because the pros are using it doesn't mean that it's always the best for us. Um, so there are kind of a few things to kind of bear in mind that when um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later when we talk about kind of setups and how to kind of help our clients or friends or ourselves on which strings and rackets we should use um, but we should always kind of look at ourselves more than um, what the pros are using because you know their ability their physique their needs are different to most of ours um, but yeah so that they're kind of uh, in terms of composition they're kind of your uh, your differences in how the strings are made with regards to the the different the different types uh, and here you can see just again some simple illustration on on tension and gauges. Um, you have your lower tension in general equals more power, and your higher tension equals more control. Again, this is a generalization, but that's obviously um, yeah uh, pretty pretty standard. Then your thicker gauge will be uh, will give you more durability. Your thinner gauge will give you more playability, meaning uh, more power and more spin. Um, one thing to note that uh, when you increase the, um, the gauge, so when you go from a thinner gauge to a thicker gauge, so, so string is measured in, uh, at least here in Europe, in millimeters, um, of the diameter of the string ranges from, there are a few thinner ones, but let's say between 1.2 millimeters uh, all the way up to kind of 1.4 millimeters, but 1.25, 1.3 are kind of your most uh, common strings, uh, gauges you're gonna find. And even um, a difference of a 1.25 millimeter string to a 1.3 millimeter string, which is only a difference of 0.05 millimeters, uh, will actually um, increase the tension of the racket by, by sort of five to 10%. Uh, so that is something to bear in mind that when you, um, for example, say you feel like you're breaking strings too often, um, or so sorry <laughs> so, yeah and uh, yeah so you're um, breaking strings too often so you want to increase the gauge so you want a thicker string so it lasts a bit longer you have to remember maybe dropping the tension slightly when you do so the thicker the gauge you just want to drop the tension slightly the thinner the gauge um the the tight the looser it's going to feel slightly um the differences aren't huge but it's again it's just a little thing to be aware of when you do um, make these kind of slight adjustments um, so then I've got, as you can see, I've got a couple of things to bear in mind that when, uh, when it comes to tension and also um, the strings that you can use. Uh, so a term that I think I've maybe have covered in some, some YouTube videos or, you, or terms you may have heard before, uh, you have snapback. And uh, snapback is one of the uh, most popular terms when it comes to kind of describing a good string. So a string with snapback basically means how quickly, how quickly the ball's the strings can be impacted by the balls and then return back into its original shape. Um, so obviously if you imagine you have um, just the net and the ball hits the net, it just drops, the, that netting doesn't return to its original shape. So there's no power, there's no spin going back into the ball. Um, so vice versa, when you have good strings with um, low friction between the mains and the crosses, 
um, and good elasticity, you're going to get a good snapback. So the ball ball's going to hit the strings like so. They're going to the racket's going to pocket the ball, uh, the, and then the strings are going to return back, snap back into their original position, generating speed um, and uh, and power on the ball, and then therefore helping playability. Um, and of course, because of the friction, the lower the tension is, the more the strings can move. So you do allow the strings to move more. So that's why you can get more spin um, at lower tensions. Obviously, at higher tensions, when you get more control, um, the strings aren't allowed to move as much. So you're going to get less of that kind of snapback feeling um, and when you, when you strike the ball. Uh, with snapback and tensions, you have something that's called the launch angle, um, which, again, if I actually should have had a racket with me, but I don't, unfortunately. But if you imagine that the ball hits the strings uh, at very low tension, the ball hits the strings, the ball, the strings pocket the ball, uh, the ball shoots down, and then as it, because of the low tension, it actually hits and then drops slightly. So then the angle that it comes out at is slightly higher than the angle that, of the racket face when you hit the ball. Uh, and this is important, this helps with, uh, with depth uh, and power, because obviously when the, the trajectory is higher over the net, you're gonna get more distance on the ball, so therefore more depth. Um, vice versa, if the tension is high, um, the strings, like I said, can't move as much um, and therefore the launch angle is going to be lower. So imagine if you just have, uh, let's say, a plank of wood, ball hits a plank of wood, it just drops. Um, so it's basically the opposite of that. So you're going to, and that's why you can control the ball a little bit better with, uh, with a higher tension um, is because you can, you can uh, control that launch angle a little bit better. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, ball friction, which isn't something that, has actually as big an impact on the, let's say the spin or the effect of the ball as people might think, for example, uh, whether using a rough string or a smooth string, it doesn't actually affect the ball to string friction. Um, isn't a huge thing in, in, um, uh, in when you hit the ball, because obviously the ball, there are so many other factors like the snapback, the launch angle, the ball actually pockets the strings. It doesn't actually rip across the strings. Uh, so the, uh, the shape of the string doesn't affect um, the ball as much. So, for example, if you use two strings, one rough, one smooth, the difference in spin if you're swinging at high speeds isn't so big. At lower speeds, so when the racket head is slower, so when the ball has more time to hit the strings, then you might actually notice a bigger difference. Um, so actually sometimes you, you're probably going to, if you have quite a fast, fast enough racket head acceleration, you're going to get more out of a uh, thinner gauge, and actually a smoother string uh, because that means that the mains and the crosses they can move more freely and that's actually going to give you a little bit more spin than having a super rough string or edge string uh, which again is another little sort of I guess misconception um, but yeah I hope that made sense and then with tensions um, these days with uh, the introduction of so many monofilament polyesters we've seen like a generalized drop in tension um, especially among club players um, and um, uh, whereas the pros, they still vary. There are some that string very loose, some that string very tight, um, pretty much between 15 kilos and up to 35, 36 kilos. So uh, there is, again, there's no right and wrong with tensions. Um, however, you, it's, like, it's, your, uh, it's all about finding your, um, uh, your balance point, let's say, because you can have, obviously, the, the looser the strings, the more power you get, uh, the tighter the strings, the more control you have. So it's about where you want your um, happy medium. Do you want, you know, do you want more power so you only have to think about the control, or do you want more control so you can actually really hit through the ball? Um, and that's again, that's up to you. Um, finding out, uh, testing, just trying, uh, finding out what kind of works best for you. Um, the only thing I would say that has become sort of more uh, popular recently um or well not recently but sort of over the last sort of 10 years or so is the dropping the tension in the crosses um is is something that i i'm a fan of it's not something that you have to do um by any means there are many players that don't um for me it just feels that the uh, it improves the, the snap back of the strings so, because there's a, if there's less tension on the crosses it means there's less tension on the main strings because as we weave obviously all the strings are interlinked like this as we know so the more tension on the cross strings, uh, the more overall tension on the whole racket. So you're going to, by just lowering the, the cross strings by anywhere between a kilo to two kilos is going to allow those strings to move slightly better, even 
at slightly higher tension. So you're kind of still going to get the control with a little bit of extra, uh, let's say, snapback. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, however, it's, uh, it's not right or wrong, and which is pretty much the truth with all everything when it comes to tennis. Um, you know, if it works for you and you like it, um, then then that's great. So there isn't like a set um, set way of doing things, whether it's for the strings, for the rackets, for technique, for how you should play. Um, you know, that's why tennis is so great. It, it allows us to uh, to experiment with so many different things and um, and try so many different variations. Um, so yeah, I hope that cleared up a little bit of um, uh, yeah a little a bit of um, unknown when it comes to kind of tensions and gauges and uh, having to string a little bit you know looser or tighter depending on the gauge thickness um, and also things that you can try and be aware of next time you play so if you've perhaps never really thought about or heard of snapback or the launch angle then perhaps next time try um, you know and and feel out those couple different things um, I'm going to come back to kind of launch angle and snapback as well when we talk about rackets and string pattern because obviously a big part of the string setup is also the string pattern of the racket. So I'm going to I'm going to come back around to that in a minute. Um, and then so now, as I said, we're going to move on to rackets. If there are any questions on um, on the strings uh, in like sort of the key areas, um, feel free to write them in the comments, and we're going to try and answer them all at the end. Um, I will talk a little bit more about setups um, in a minute as well. Um, so maybe just hold off with a to you know, let's see if I hopefully I can answer some more questions that you may have um, first. So um, first of all, rackets, um, we're going to look at how they're made. Uh, I have a video uh, because it's easier if, if it's just a two minute video for those of you that haven't seen how a racket is made. Um, you, it's easier if I just give you a visual um, reference. So uh, let me see. Oh, sorry. Let's, do, do, do. Let's get across here. One second. Why is this? Yeah. There we go. So hopefully you can all see that. Uh, and, and here's a two minute video. Over 35 years of experience to craft a racket. Before shaping the racket, additional pieces of prepreg are placed in key areas of the shaper. The tube of prepreg has been slightly heated to make it more pliable, but it's still difficult to work with. Silvio then carefully forms the racket into shape, removing excess material at the handle and inserts an adapter into the bladder. Some additional pieces of prepreg are applied to the handle of the racket along with weights to help bring the racket to the correct specification. So Silvio is bringing all over the pre-shaped racket, pre-formed, and now he puts it into the mold. And this is where it's so important that the size of the pre-forming actually fits to the actual size of the mold. Otherwise, you have wrinkles or you have other problems. So this is really where the, let's say, small details are important. And then at the same time, you're forcing air in through the yes. handle area. Uh, pressurized air is pushed into the bladder, the transparent bladder. So the bladder expands, pushes all the carbon fibers to the mold, and then the resin hardens out. Uh, the resin first, if you heat, it becomes very liquid. So it flows everywhere, viscosity going down. And after some minutes, it starts to harden out. And when the resin really hardens out, then this is where we kind of bake a tennis racket. So now you will need a glove. It's still going to be pretty hot when it goes yes. So this is now the cured racket. So there we have it. Um, so that's kind of a, a good um, overview of how um, of how the racket is made. Um, as we can see that they are, it's layers of um, carbon fiber um, that are rolled into, um, uh, rolled onto this uh, long piece and then they're added to the mold. And so along that uh, long tube, there's basically a, a map of uh, where they have to play place carbon fiber in different areas um, in, order to, um, in order to make up the construction of the racket. So um, making it stiffer, 
or, uh, or more flexible in certain areas and so forth. And also you could see with the weight. So that, that's how all rackets are made. It's just, it was just easy to show you guys a video. There is a whole video. I think that I borrowed that video from Tennis Warehouse on YouTube. So if you're more interested in, in it, go and check that video out later because it's, it's a pretty good in-depth one. Um, but yeah, so they're, so they're added to this mold. Um, and as you saw, they, um, uh, it's then gone into a uh, mold and heated and, uh, and then you come out with the finished racket. Um, so then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some key differences in the um, in rackets in general. You have your uh, your head size differences. Um, and again, these are kind of generalizations. There are different rackets with smaller or bigger head sizes and so on. But I'm kind of just going to cover, let's say, the large majority of them. Um, so generally, you find rackets between 90 to about 105 square inches. However, these days, your most popular rackets are between 97 and 100 square inches, which is only a difference of about three, three square inches, um, which might not seem like a lot, but when it comes to um, playability and the feeling of the racket, uh, those, uh, that size difference does make it, you, you would notice it. Um, obviously one of the most sort of famous 90 square inch rackets, small head rackets was the one that um, Federer obviously used to use, um, the, the Pro Staff. Um, and they also did one in 85 and uh, back in the day the heads of the racket used to be much smaller um, and then let's say the first sort of 100 square inch racket that became super popular is the pure drive the bablab pure drive which obviously is still around today and still super popular um, so with regards to head size the differences are the smaller the head size again the more control you have um, but you do have a smaller sweet spot um, and you're going to get uh, less power out of the frame um, and then obviously vice versa, the bigger the head size, um, the, the bigger the sweet spot and the more power you're going to get, but at a loss of slight control. Um, and that's generally why the sort of the happy medium is between that 97 to 100 square inch mark. Um, and then, yeah, and again, it comes down to what you prefer. Again, would you like a racket with um, more control or more power? Again, that's sort of for you guys to, to figure out yourselves and kind of try with um, what you think and then beam width um, goes together kind of with the head size so you can have um, uh, the beam width is obviously the thickness of the beam and that they generally range between 19 to 20 millimeters up to around 26 there are again there are smaller and thinner and thicker ones however um, they're kind of your yeah main differences and you have different style of frames you have some that are um, constant square beams so it's the same thickness all the way around the racket uh, like for example a prestige um, they have that kind of square or they used to have that square square shape and that's just the same thickness all the way around or you have um, rackets that kind of change shape as they go around so they start for example like the Babla aero drive that has kind of that aerodynamic kind of uh, plain wing uh, throat and then they go out into that kind of classic Babla um, head shape um, again the thinner the frame you're going to get um, less power, a bit more control, um, and then again, the bigger the head frame, uh, the bigger, sorry, the thicker the frame of the, uh, of the racket, the more power you're gonna get. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about stiffness. Um, so stiffness is measured in RA, um, and it's measured by the racket is um, put into a grip, and then a weight is placed on the racket, and then depending on how much it moves, it gives you your stiffness rating. And, um, and that generally ranges between 55 on the low end and 75 on the very high end. Generally, your rackets, again, these days are going to be between 60 to 70. Um, you're going to be pushed to find a racket these days under 60 um, RA. Um, generally, because the materials now are able to absorb a lot more vibration before, um, the, the stiffer the racket, the more, more vibration you're going to get through your arm. Uh, and through your uh, hand um, so that's why um, and you're going to lose a little bit of feeling with that um, but nowadays you can still have a very stiff racket and still um, still not have too much vibration which is why you see um, you know sort of big powerful frames with uh, that aren't causing people um, arm injuries anymore which is great um, and a common misconception with stiffness is that a lot of the time people confuse the two and actually think that a what is actually a flexible racket is very stiff because it's not powerful. However, the higher the stiffness in the racket, the higher generally um, the power, the more powerful the racket is. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. For example, 
Uh, I hear people say all the time, oh, the for example, I use the procedure as an example, because it is a thin beam with a relatively low stiffness that people find the racket very stiff because the ball doesn't go anywhere and it's hard to play with, but it's actually, the frame, the frame is actually flexible, for example, compared to um, your pure drive or something kind of in a similar kind of um, region, they're actually very stiff frames because the stiffer the frame is, the more energy is returned back into the strings and back into the ball when we play and therefore making them more powerful. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind that, you know, that maybe you might not have been aware of that the, um, that the stiffer the frame um, is actually the more powerful it is. Um, and then, as I said, we have our string pattern, um, our general kind of, let's say, top three at the moment um, is either uh, 16, 19, 18, 20, and actually the last one was supposed to be 18, 16, so I don't know why I wrote 2018. I mean, that does exist as well, but um, it's now become a little bit of a uh, trend or, or people have been testing out having um, uh, less crosses than main. So you have end up with uh, 18 main strings and then 16 crosses. Um, and that just gives, like I said, a different um, uh, launch angle, a different ball trajectory um, and a different feeling um, on the strings. So, um, so still tennis is always evolving. Uh, rackets are always evolving. Um, so it's always good to kind of test out new things if you're interested in it. Um, as a generalization, again, your, the more open the string, the more open the gaps in the, in the racket are. So uh, the more open the string patterns, for example, a 16, 19 string pattern is going to give you more spin and more power um, because the strings can move more and, uh, and the, you have more snapback. So yeah, there you see how kind of string pattern goes together with the strings themselves and then, and tension. So kind of obviously these strings, these three things, they loop in together. Then you have, um, a very common one as well, 1820, um, where you have quite a dense string pattern. So the gaps in the strings are quite small. Um, and again, that goes together with a tighter tension. So they, uh, strings are able to move less and, um, and therefore you have more control, but less power and less depth. Um, and again, these are, this is something to bear in mind when you come to trying to find your perfect setup, um, because you want to kind of take, uh, like, areas of all, like all the different aspects um, and, then, and then see uh, how you balance them out best in order to suit yourself. Obviously, you don't want to go extreme in one way. For example, have a very thick string, a very stiff string uh, at very high tension in an 1820 racket because it's going to become virtually unplayable. Um, you know, so you might want the tight string pattern because you like the feel, you want perhaps a hybrid, uh, so you get a bit of stiffness and a bit of softness um, at slightly low tension, so you still do get a bit of movement. That's just an example of how you can kind of um, balance out all the different little sort of, let's say three or four key aspects, which I would put down to those when it comes to um, finding the right setup, because uh, I think people, in my opinion, often change rackets too quickly before changing the strings. I feel like, in my opinion anyway, that the strings can have such a huge impact on the racket that unless you're playing obviously with a completely wrong racket, it is worth investing a little bit of time into trying uh, to find the right setup for yourself before um, going and changing racket because you could get another racket uh, which is just as good for you as the last one, but the setup is still wrong and then you have another one, another one. Whereas if you kind of find the right feeling the right setup in terms of uh, tension and string pattern um, and gauge, um, you know, the, the, then you're going to be able to kind of figure out what you want uh, a little bit uh, faster. Um, and then lastly, the length of the racket can um, uh, obviously can vary between 26 and a half inch, which is half an inch shorter than regular length. Uh, 26 inches is a junior size, 27 inch is the regular adult size and, um, and then the longest the racket can be is 29 inches. Um, generally let's say XL rackets are normally half an inch uh, longer sometimes a little bit less so normally you get 27 and a half inch. There are a few pro players that play very very long. Um, I think um, uh, Diego Schwartzman plays with a, with a long very long racket um, and a few others as well but otherwise they generally the XL ones are only um, half an inch at, at the most, longer than, um, than usual. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the racket weight and the balance, how that affects the racket. Um, so we have obviously 
here you can see a kind of, again, this is, uh, bear in mind, this is generalization, um, but these are just kind of to get across the key um, aspects of the- I don't understand. Oh, sorry, that's Siri talking to me. Uh, the key aspects of, um, uh, of racket weight and balance. So as we can see here, uh, we have, if we take a very light racket, um, and a racket that has a lot of weight towards the grip, so grip heavy, you're gonna have a racket that's very easy to maneuver um, and play with because uh, it's gonna be very light, you can swing it very fast, move it very fast. However, as we can see, it's gonna mean that we're not gonna have very much power or stability. So uh, again, if we go across and make the racket very heavy um, and we put more weight towards the, uh, the head, we're gonna get more power and more stability. In theory, this line is not straight. Um, however, just kind of for reference, I made it straight. Um, so the, you obviously don't, again, you don't want to go super extreme and have a racket that is very head heavy and heavy in general because you're not going to be able to maneuver it uh, or play with it. So generally, players that play, uh, you, kinda, you generally want to play uh, in one plane, let's say. So if you like to play with a heavy racket because you like the feeling and the stability of it, you generally want to keep the weight distributed slightly more towards the grip. However, if you like the feeling of the racket head accelerating because it's quite head heavy, then it's worth keeping the overall weight of the racket down. Um, so that's something kind of to bear in mind. Um, and these kind of two aspects um, combine to create uh, your swing weight. Um, again, the swing weight is not like a perfect line through there. However, Kind of might give you a slight reference. So that's something to bear in mind um, that just because the racket, you make a racket heavier doesn't mean that it's gonna necessarily feel heavier. You might get a racket that is 10, 15 grams lighter, but you pick it up and you, oh, that feels really heavy or it's, you know, it doesn't swing so uh, as fast when you just hold it in the beginning and that might be because it's quite head heavy. Um, so again, when it comes to finding your setup or, um, you know, finding the right racket for a client or a friend or yourself, Bear in mind also the balance of the racket that, um, you know, the perfect racket might, you might really like, but it might be worth um, putting five, six grams in the grip because it's just going to make that racket a little bit more maneuverable um, and easier to play with. Um, so, yes, yeah, so bear that in mind when, you, uh, when you're looking at rackets and balance. And now I'm going to come on to uh, customizing and, uh, and just cover kind of the distribution of weight and how it can affect the racket's performance. Um, because obviously we get a lot of There is no right or wrong, like I've been saying, um, but as a generalization, we, um, I can kind of give you uh, here the kind of two um, biggest, con or the kind of the two, I two things that you can try that you can notice sort of the most difference in, and then you can find out what you like and what you don't like. Uh, and this ties in obviously with your weight and your balance, um, overall weight, sorry, and your, yeah, and your balance sort of graph. Um, first of all, we have something called polarization that I've spoken about previously as well, I think. Um, polarization is when we distribute the weight of furthest away possible from the balance point or the center of mass, um, which generally means at the bottom of the grip and the top of the racket. And this basically, when you impact the ball, it makes the racket have a little more um, flex, let's say. So, for example, if you're playing with a racket that you feel is a little bit stiff, uh, you might it might be worth... Um, adding a bit of weight um, to the top and the bottom, and that's just going to give you a little bit more flexion. So as you hit the ball, um, the racket head is just going to come through um, and snap with the ball a little bit more. And that's kind of what polarization means. So that so a very unpolarized racket would be, let's say, we want to add 10 grams of weight overall, and the the balance point of the racket is 32. Uh, we we add all, all 10 grams to the balance point. That's going to make the racket very unpolarized. Um, so it's going to make it more uh, stiff and more s solid on impact, but it's going to give you a little bit less um, power. So again, so that's something that you can try. You can, you know, you can play around with. Obviously, these are the two extremes. Um, find out if you, you know, if you like that feeling. If you don't, um, and then we have uh, a very common thing that you see. You know, you see the weight at ten and two uh, on rackets, um, and this generally helps with stability, frame stability, and the twist weight or the so the torsion in the head of the racket on contact. Um, this is especially good for frames that are slightly on the thinner side or on the less powerful side, that if we add a bit of weight on the, um, uh, around 10 and two, 
Um, again, the amount comes down to however you want to play and, and the balance and so on. But just by adding some weight across let, what the sweet spot area of the, of the racket would be, um, it's going to make your uh, impact cleaner um, and a lot more solid. So I think they're kind of two aspects that I think everybody could try or can hopefully understand quite simply. And, um, and by just trying those two different things, you're going to find quite, you know, uh, I think quite a lot of difference in any, in any racket that you kind of, you try them with. Um, you can also try them together. You can, you know, you can make a racket. If you have a light racket that you want to make a fair bit heavier then you do have, you know, you can add, uh, let's say five grams to the grip, three grams to the top of the racket, and then um, four grams on each side, you know, and then you're going to add sort of 18, 17, 18 um, grams of, uh, of weight overall. And, and uh, you're going to be able to kind of get still a solid frame with a little bit of flexion in it. Um, but yeah, like I said, these are things that you guys, you know, that you should all try for yourselves. Um, don't take my word for it um, because uh, I'm not you. I can't feel what you feel. So you, what, you know, what you might interpret as tight or heavy or uh, soft or elastic or all these things are all personal to you. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of the biggest thing that I try and help. Uh, either players with or clients with is that when you know when we get asked a lot you know to help with setups or rackets so obviously we try and take um, information from clients uh, or players and put them into a physical setup um, however it always comes down to you so it, you have to you know you have to feel them out for yourself but these are kind of aspects that or these are kind of a few guidelines hopefully that everything kind of made sense that you guys can try uh, and will help in your selection process um so yeah thanks for listening and um i think we're going to take a couple of questions now um so i hope you guys all found that um interesting and um yeah i look forward to hearing some questions from you hi first of all great job uh learned a lot there that i didn't know even though i'm around tennis a long time picked up a lot of things i always thought ahead prestige was very stiff yes yeah yeah, yeah is, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. know that so that was good hope the Hope people picked up some good tips there. But now we're going to just, you're going to make me host, first of all. And then yeah. secondly, Keen is going to go through some of the questions that were there. And yeah, he'll ask you. So looking forward to hearing the questions. Okay. So, Fabio's now host again. Hi, Fabio, you're host now. Okay, Nikki, we'll jump straight into it then. Yeah, uh, we have okay. a lot of questions here. So uh, let's get started. The first mm -hmm. one is from Alex. Hi, I'd just like to know what's Nikki's opinion. Oh, what's Nikki's opinion on the pro stringer machine is as I'm thinking of getting one when I go to university as it's so portable. Uh, yeah, the pro stringer is great. It's actually a machine that I used a lot when I was, um, when I was younger, when I was traveling, I, um, I always, I actually, I strung a lot, a lot of rackets on, on the pro string. I had one of the original ones. Um, and, uh, it was the first kind of portable electric machine that I found. Um, so I, I, there are a lot of, let's say, purist stringers that don't like it, but that's maybe just because they haven't been in the situation where it's been useful. Uh, but I, yeah, I have to say, I really, I really like it. I like, um, it's, yeah, it is super portable. You can string on a table, on a chair. I've strung on a hotel mini bar. I've literally anywhere. So, um, yeah, I, th I think they're great. Obviously you don't want to be stringing tens, twenties, 50 rackets a day on them, but for, for a player that's traveling and stuff, I think, I think they're great. Okay, nice one. And actually, Fabio sells a very similar uh, machine, actually called the Easy Stringer. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, look, I'm not sure if Fabio wants to jump in there. Wait, I'll just jump in quickly. We're out of stock at the moment because they've got a lot more expensive. But what are your thoughts on the Easy Stringer, Nikki? Just as a really portable solution, is it any use? Uh, yeah. I mean, again, I I like the creativity behind it. I tested it. I thought it was I thought it was actually pretty good. Um, it has a few um, downsides, I guess, compared to let's say like the um, pro stringer. However, the up biggest upside with it is that it isn't electric, so you can literally string anywhere. You can string in a park, in a tennis club. You don't need electricity, so that's cool. And it is a fair bit lighter than the pro stringer. Um, and I was able to string with it quite quite comfortably. Um, so I think it is good. However. It, you, I would do less rackets on the on the easy stringer than I would personally on the pro stringer because the pro stringer does give you 
a little bit better um, tensions. Uh, it does have a constant pull. So it has a couple of little features that, yeah, that in my opinion, just edges it. However, the, the easy stringer is great because uh, it is even more portable than the pro stringer. Great. All right, let's okay. go. Awesome. We'll move on. Uh, so next one is from George and Tatiana. They're tennis parents. Is there any particular reason why sometimes a mainstream breaks at the end of mainstringing? One last piece. It breaks inside the grommet hole and it's not concerned with excessive tension or any other pressure on the strings. Um, it could be, it can come down to the type of string that it is. Uh, it may also be that the grommet, so the plastic piece that goes around the racket, um, has like a small needle in it or, um, or a crack uh, or like a little edge. It could also be the stringer. Um, for example, if the clamps are too tight and because uh, obviously you always clamp the string closest to the grommet as possible uh, to the hole. Um, so it could just be that the clamps are too tight. So it just marks the string a little bit. Then when you hit the ball, um, there's obviously where it's been clamped or marked, the string breaks. And then because obviously when the string breaks, it moves. So when you look at it, you think that it may have broken inside the hole, but it may in fact be just outside where the clamp mark is. So it might be worth looking when it happens next time. Just have a look at on the long string. If you see kind of any teeth marks, it, that could be a reason. Um, yeah, apart okay. from that, maybe it just needs new, new grommets. Okay, well, I'm sure they'll be happy with that answer. So uh, we'll move on to the next one from Camilla. Uh, racket mm -hmm. tension recommendation versus string tension recommendation. Which one should I follow? Racket tension versus string yeah. Tension. So I th I think what she means on this one is uh, is what's rec recommended on the racket. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Gotcha. Um, I would go with. I would ask your string. I would ask the person that's stringing the racket for you or your tennis coach better than kind of. Uh, otherwise, maybe go for the recommended racket tension. Um, however, I would. Yeah, I would generally. I would speak to your stringer or your coach. They're kind of going to be the two people that can a little bit better um, advise you depending, you know, on your ability, on your physique, on the racket you're using on the string. Um, but as a generalization, if you had to choose one, I would maybe, yeah, go for the average that the racket recommends. Um, yeah. But yeah, nice. speak to your stringer or your coach. Nice, nice. So we have one from James here. What's your, uh, it's a bit, bit specific, but what's your opinion on the Technifiber Triax or Triax? I haven't tried it, unfortunately, um, so I can't, I can't say. I've not been out playing loads lately, so I've not actually been out testing huge amounts of products, um, so unfortunately I can't help you on yeah, that one. James is ahead of the game there. Uh, we have one from Enrique. Uh, what's the lowest tension you've experienced or seen or even heard of on the ATP Tour? Uh, the lowest tension, I think, is... I'm trying to... Uh, um, because uh, Kukuchkin, Kukuchkin he, I think he's around 13 kilos, 13 and a half kilos, which is, what's that? That's like 30 pounds, just under 30 pounds. Um, so yeah, that's crazy low. Okay, well, that is very, very low. We have one here from uh, Jens. How would you string a racket for a nine-year-old uh, that's already playing tennis for six years now in terms okay. of string tension and what type of string should you use? Yeah, I, th I think this is, I, for me, this is kind of one of the areas that I'm, let's say, more passionate about um, is finding the right strings for juniors um, because no offense to you know, the older generation, they've already been playing for a while. So for, for juniors, I see a lot of juniors um, playing with, with like terrible string setups because, um, because obviously that like, you know, like all of us, we see what the pros are using and we think, okay, we want to use that. Um, but for younger for younger juniors, even though they're playing at a, like at a high level, they can still quite happily be using um, a multi-filament or a good synthetic gut. Uh, the synthetic gut is because uh, it of, of because it has that um, that center core. It is going to give you a little bit crisper feeling than a multi-filament. So you are still going to be able to generate enough spin. You are still going to be able to generate uh, power. Um, so, which is something that I think people. Just expect you, you can only get spin and power with, or spin in general with, uh, with um, polyester. So I see too many juniors with, you know, like your Alu Power, your uh, RPM Blast, your, you know, these, these are strings that are made for, you know, for, for adults or for athletes um, that I think players or parents or coaches should hold back on their kids using. There are now, like I said, some more softer strings coming out. 
Um, I think the Luxon one, there's one called uh, Luxon Bronze. No, uh, what's it called? Element. They also have Adrenaline, which is quite nice and soft. Head has a Lynx, just the normal Lynx. And they're kind of transition polyesters, maybe. Um, or for people that have, um, have sort of sore wrist or elbow, these are polyesters that are on the softer scale. Um, so they might be good for, uh, even for a nine-year-old, I, I would stay away still until they get to kind of 10, 11. But at that age, if they're playing a lot and they are used to playing, then you can kind of introduce them to the softer polyesters. And then by the time they get 13, 14, then they can then move on to sort of uh, stiffer strings. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. We have one here from Peter. How useful or necessary is pre-stretching multifilament strings? And at what tension would you recommend to pre-stretch at? Uh, pre-stretching multifilament, I wouldn't do it whatsoever, personally, uh, unless it's specifically asked for. Pre-stretch is generally reserved for, um, for natural gut. There are or even some players that pre-stretch uh, polyester. Again, I wouldn't personally recommend it. It's going to make this. What it does is it obviously, for those that don't know, pre-stretch takes, say you string your racket at 25 kilos, uh, 55 pounds, generally pre-stretch is between five to 10% more. And then, so basically what the machine does, it'll pull the string to, say your string at 25 kilos, it'll pull the string to 27 and a half, so 10% more, so two and a half kilos more, and then it'll go back to, uh, to 25 kilos. And that reduces a little bit of the elasticity in the string um, and actually dampens the, um, the uh, properties of the string. So, which is useful sometimes for natural gut because natural gut can be very elastic and lively. Uh, so it just gives the, the natural gut a little bit more control. Um, so it's a little bit easier to control. On multifilaments, personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, so yeah, but normally it's 10% more than, um, than whatever tension it is you're stringing at. Okay. Uh, we have one here from Fur. Looks like he's stringing uh, between a natural gut and a poly. And he's saying, uh, where would you recommend to put each string in the crosses or on the mains? And what's the tension difference between them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. So when basically when you have um, uh, generally, again, this is a slight generalization, but nowadays you see more players playing with natural gut in the mains and then their polyester string in the crosses. Uh, and this is actually what gives, um, again, the ball a slightly higher arc over the net. Uh, so you get a higher launch angle. Uh, so you get better depth, a bit more spin. Um, for example, who uses it? Federer uses it. Um, Djokovic uses it. A few players are. Um, so that generally is going to give you that sort of more depth, a little bit less control. So you can't actually push the ball. You have to hit the ball because otherwise the ball will fly. Um, if you have natural gut in the mains, because obviously they're the ones that are creating that, um, let's say, trampoline effect or that pocketing effect. Whereas if you go the other way around, and you have your polyesters in the mains and your um, more elastic natural gut in the crosses, um, then you're going to get a little bit more control. The ball is going to actually dip much sooner and the general, uh, the launch angle is going to be lower. So the trajectory of the net is going to be a bit lower, allowing you kind of to hit through the ball more. Um, for example, Andy Murray uses it um, and plenty of other players use it. It just gives you a little bit more softness, a little bit more control. Uh, to find out which one you like more, you just have to try both. That's kind of, yeah, could, the, neither one is better or worse. You just have to try them both and, uh, and see which one you prefer. Okay, we have another question here from Marek. You were talking about the weights on the racket at 10 and 2. Uh, he wants to know what about 9 and 3 and if there's any difference. Uh, no. Um, I mean, obviously, the, obviously, the 10 and 2 is just a reference, generally because... We have to remember that the sweet spot of the racket is not exactly center of the frame um, of the head. So the sweet spot is generally slightly above the middle of the racket. So that's why 10 and 2. Uh, but obviously also it depends how much weight you're putting. If you're putting um, six, 6 grams or 8 grams in total, 4 grams each side, it's going to be about this much anyway. So it's kind of going to cover both areas. But you can, you know, you can lower it down. You even have players uh, that have the weight further down the throat. Um, it's just going to as well not have such, it's going to have less of an impact on the balance of the racket as well. Um, again, it's not right or wrong. Um, find out, try, maybe try both or, um, and then which one you kind of like, but yeah, between 10 and two or nine and three, the difference is not going to be, not going to be huge. Okay. I have a question here from James Haas. Actually, he asked it before, so I should jump to him. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk more about box beam and the modern shaped throat? So constant beam versus variable beam. Yeah. Um, what the differences are. Yeah, I, I, I guess I covered it a little bit. Um, the, the more, because the technologies have evolved slightly. So before you had more box beams, um, square beams. So the constant, like I kind of said, prestige of the old radical shapes um, because it gave better stability in the racket. Um, so you've got a more uh, constant, more consistent feeling from the racket. But nowadays, because of the um, vibration dampening techniques, because of the improvement in materials and the layups of the racket, they can now have uh, like varying shape and widths of, of the racket, and you can still get the same um, the same feeling, the same stability out of the racket. You might you're going to get better aerodynamics from a, from a racket that perhaps is, you know, is more angular. Uh, so therefore you get faster racket speed, giving you more spin with less effort. Uh, so they're kind of the sort of the main reasons that, um, that these days you see more rackets with, uh, with various uh, beam widths. Okay. I have a question here from Renouk. The fewer cross strings on the racket is the launch angle greater. Fewer cross strings. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in general, yes, because the less strings you have in general, the, the higher the launch angle is going to be. Um, so yes, yeah, if you do have, um, if you have a more open string pattern, um, less crosses as well, you're going to get uh, more spin. That's why, for example, you have, which is the blade spin, I think it's called blade S, which I think is 18 main strings, um, and, uh, 16 crosses. So, um. And, that, and that's going to give you a very high trajectory of the ball. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have so many questions here. I'm only going to go to the ones that are kind of more general because uh, the specific okay. ones don't benefit everybody. But we have one here okay. from Leon. How should we choose between headlight or head heavy rackets? Um, yeah. Um, but just bear in mind that the head light racket so a racket with more weight towards the grip is generally going to be a little bit more stable um it's going to be a little bit easier to swing faster to swing uh probably will feel nicer at the net um if you if you like to you know because it's going to be easier to volley with for example a slightly more head heavy racket um is going to give you um a little bit more speed when you swing the racket um so it's going to kind of help you um uh, when you hit the ball it's going to make your ball travel further um, but it's going to be a little bit less stable and it's going to need more effort to move. Um, so they're kind of your, yeah, let's say sort of generalizations on, on head light versus head heavy. Okay. Uh, quick question on playing on different surfaces. When I move surface, say from a hard court to a clay court, I know mm -hmm. we don't probably at our level or most people listening probably don't play in grass courts too often. Should they be stringing at different tensions depending on the surface they play at or play on? Uh, Yes, I would say so. And also not only tension, uh, not only surface, but also weather. Uh, so now that we've come kind of into winter season, it is worth everybody kind of dropping a kilo to even maybe two kilos. Um, because obviously the colder the, the weather is, the less the ball travels, uh, we're stiffer, we have even less energy. So it is worth getting a little bit extra help from our racket. Same thing if we go from a hard court um, to a clay court, for example, a hard court, the ball generally travels faster. So we need a little bit more control. So uh, we would generally have um, rackets strung for hard court a little bit tighter than when we go on clay. We're going to naturally try to hit with more spin. Uh, so we're going to bring the ball down um, so we can reduce the, reduce the tension slightly. But it is worth noting that the weather also makes a big difference. Um, so you know, if, if you're playing indoors or in a bubble or even outdoors and it's cold, it is definitely worth reducing the tension of the strings. Um, your body's going to thank you for it. Okay, question here from Marek. Uh, why are most players, pro players, using rackets with older moulds? Um, again, it's, it's a misconception that they are better. They're not better at all. Uh, actually, in some cases, they're worse. They just are the rackets that they personally like or they have played with for a long time. Um, so probably what you're going to see in um, five, ten years' time, that the players that are coming up now, your, your young players, I know your team or like even the young young ones like Sinner, uh, these guys, Sissy Pass, they're going to be using rackets that are current now or were current last year or the year before, but in 10 years time, they're going to be old models. And it's not that um, they, the new ones aren't good. It's just that they're the ones they've always played with and they're the ones they like. Uh, 
um, you know, because it does take, like we all know, it takes a bit of time to get used to a different racket. Uh, so if players had to change frame every year, they need a little bit of time to get used to that all the time. So generally, they do stick with the same one just because it's what they're used to. It's not because older rackets are, or the older rackets, this kind of pro-stop myth that they're better than than, uh, than the rackets that we buy. They're generally, they're generally not. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Florian. Is it worth to buy a pro stock racket? And when do you suggest to buy a pro stock version? And where can you even get them as a regular, like recreational club player? Um, simple answer is no. Uh, generally, I would say no, personally, um, because there are so many good rackets out there from so many different brands that if you can't find one that's out there, then it's because you need to change your setup or, or your, perhaps even your expectation. Uh, there's just the feeling that if a racket has the word pro stock attached to it, it's therefore going to be better. Um, but that's just, it's not the case. The, the racket's made with the same molds uh, or materials um, that, that you're using uh, that you can get. They're just made in a smaller batch uh, in a different factory. But they, you know, it's not like um, the ones that, that you buy in the shop are made out of you know like third grade materials and then you know the ones that the the pro stock ones um are much much better that's generally not the case so um i personally wouldn't invest my money in um in finding a pro stock racket personally i would invest that money in finding the right setup for yourself having more tennis lessons and just generally playing more tennis spend that money on playing more tennis rather than uh, for example, a retail blade versus a pro stock blade, the only difference you're going to really notice is that one is matte and one is shiny. That's pretty much the only difference you're going to notice, for example. So personally, I would say no. Fabian? Okay. I was going to say Wilson now offered the ability to buy these pro stock rackets, but yes. I've had it. I've played with some of them, some of obviously Nikki's mm -hmm. friend, Nikki knows a lot of pros and I've seen the rackets and they're so hard to play with. And yeah, I, I put it down to a little bit like a race car, a really fast race car that's tuned to like an F1 car. That's the equivalent of a pro player's racket. Unless you're a really talented racing driver, your, your skills won't, you know, you're not going to utilize the racket to its fullest potential. And yeah, so that's what I think. I think they're very expensive to like 350 euros. And if you want two or three of them, you're talking like a thousand euros, which is absolutely crazy. And so I think you're, as Nikki says, Normally, a lot of players tend to go back to the racket they played with as kids because they're so comfortable with that racket. And that's why, as he said, pros still use the rackets they used when they were juniors now from like the Fedra, Dimitrov, all those guys. So as he says, work on your string, your racket setup. You can get a lot more from that and it's a lot cheaper as well. Yeah, exactly. Invest, you know, get some tennis lessons. People, you know, sometimes they look too much into strings and rackets and stuff. And sometimes you just need to practice more, unfortunately, for all of us. It must so, um, yeah, I agree. I agree totally that it, they are, yeah. You know. Okay, a few more last questions quickly because I know we're coming up to the end of time soon. Uh, one here from Timothy. Why don't most pro players use vibration dampeners? Why do or don't they? Uh, well, he says, why don't they? Maybe that's not the case. Uh, yeah, I would say, no, he's probably right. I would say probably maybe 60, 70% play without. Generally, because if you have a little bit more vibration, because the vibration dampener obviously takes away the vibration so you get a little bit less feedback into your hand um so generally people say you get more feel without a vibration dampener um so that's kind of maybe one aspect plus um generally uh, the pro players that use vibration dampeners is generally because they don't like the noise not so much the feeling of the vibrations it's more you know the little ping sound that it makes um but it's just personal preference and uh, there's no right or wrong the vibration dampener might make the strings like a tiny fraction tiny tiny fraction tighter or feel slightly tighter um so again it just that comes down to personal preference there's not really um but yeah i would say it's mainly because you do get a little bit more feedback without the vibration dampener in that most a lot of players don't use one okay uh we have one here from oliver my son's one 1 1.2 23 kilo poly are breaking every week why could this be uh, depend, did he say how old this is somewhat? Uh, no, it's just, well, he says 1.20. I, I assume he's referring to the, the string size. Yeah, the gauge. Uh, I mean, 1.2 is pretty thin. Uh, if, he, if he's, 
uh, you know, 13, 14 and above, I would say 1.2 is a little bit too thin. So that that would be why. Uh, it could also be that he's really good and he's ripping the ball. Um, but yeah, I would say probably the string is a little bit too thin. So if, if I, I, obviously depending how old he is, um, if he's, you know, above 14, 13, 14, then I would say it's worth um, getting a, um, a slightly thicker gauge, like, uh, yeah, 125. Uh, and if that keeps breaking, then try 130. But um, unfortunately, tennis isn't a cheap sport and uh, players that play a lot and, uh, and play well break strings constantly. Uh, can I just jump in here? Nikki, a question that we got from Eraja here, and we've got from a few other parents. Now, Raj is a, a junior, but for like 10 year olds, what string do you recommend they should be using? Think about it, they're quite weak, they're not strong, mm-hmm. so that's easy on their arm. Now, Oliver here recommended uh, should kids use gut, but for most parents, a string that the, they can afford to break on yeah. a weekly basis. Yeah, I mean, I obviously, in an ideal world, yes, gut would be great. However, obviously, it's very expensive. Um, and, you, the, you know, a 10 year old wouldn't get the full sort of um, reward from, from using the gut. I would stick with a a good solid multi filament string, um, maybe in a thinner gauge as well, um, because they're going to get a little bit more feedback um, from the thinner string. Uh, it's also going to be a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, more lively. So I would say either a good synthetic gut or a good multi filament string. If, like I kind of was saying earlier, if they're kind of progressing to play a lot, then one of the softer polyester strings in a thin gauge like 1.2 in the adrenaline or uh, Luxal adrenaline or head links in a thin gauge, even as a hybrid. So you have that in the mains and then with a multi-filament in the crosses. So it's still going to give them enough softness with kind of still holding the balls on the strings. However, if they're not competing at like a very high level for their age, then I would still stick with a multi-filament string um, simply because they are still going to be able to generate racket speed, spin, power, control, all these sort of, the things that a 10 year old should be working on, for example, technique and movement and stuff, the strings aren't going to be making a huge impact. However, if you give them the wrong string that can sort of impair them physically with wrist or elbow or shoulder injuries, you're going to do them a lot more harm. Um, so I would, um, I would, uh, yeah, I would go for that. Okay. And it's almost time now. So the last question, sorry to everybody that we didn't get the questions answered, mm-hmm. but we have one here from Eric. Maybe it's a good one to end on. What happens when a racket gets older? When is it time to change a racket? Um, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. The, um, the only thing would be, it more comes down to how many times it's been strung. Um, Cause obviously every time the racket is strung, uh, the string beds are compressed. Uh, when you break the string then the racket frame opens slightly and compressed. So if that is happening a lot, then you know, you might need to change your racket as much as a year to a year and a half. However, if you're not stringing loads or playing huge amounts, you might, uh, the racket might be great for five, six, eight, ten 10 years um, or even more. So it just comes down to a little bit uh, new. Also, if you feel like you want something else from a racket, it might be worth trying something else. You know, after six, eight, ten 10 years, you might be able, you know, you might treat yourself to a, to a new frame and a little bit of a, you know, uh, something new and fun so you know might be worth trying it but there isn't like a sell by date they don't get old they don't sort of uh yeah degenerate in time so um they can last for a very long time perfect well thanks for answering those questions and i'll pass you back to fabio then now. Yeah. nick I, I just have one question for you what's your current setup <laughs> good question i am using a headspeed pro um with uh if i'm playing if i'm competing i'm i'm actually using natural gut in the mains with uh links uh tour in the crosses um that's kind of my um yeah that's my setup i play i used to play very heavy as well i used to play um with quite a heavy racket um but now as i'm not playing as much and stuff i've uh, i've taken a fair bit of weight off so i think my racket's around 300 and uh just under 350 grams with strings and grip and everything. But, uh, but yeah, I play with a head spree pro with a leather grip and, uh, with natural gut in the mains, um, fairly tight, like 26, 25 kilos. Nice. And I'm surprised nobody asked about the leather grip in the whole webinar. Do you recommend them or is it just personal choice? Um, personal choice in the fact that it, um, it's firmer. So you get 
a little bit more feedback again into the right like into your hand um, and you can also feel the bevels of the racket of the grip slightly better um, than on a soft grip um, so you might like that feeling you might not um, if you're not playing loads I would definitely recommend a soft grip because otherwise it is going to hurt your hand because it is firm and hard however if you are competing or playing quite a lot um, and or you just like the firm feeling then it is worth trying a leather grip um, bear in mind when you go from a synthetic grip to a leather grip it will add about five four five grams uh, to the overall weight of the racket towards the grip for those we did a great podcast episode with nikki it's still our number we've done about 67 episodes nikki's still at number two there there's still yes. people listed it every Who, week who's, so number one? who's number one is alexander vask from tennis yeah, fair enough. Right. yeah fair so enough. it's between you and him going up and down so i put that there's really a lot of knowledge in that that he didn't talk about today so i recommend you listen to that and yeah, thank you very much. We'll be back in a few weeks. The next webinar hasn't been decided yet, but we'll keep you updated. And yeah, and we'll also include Nikki's details. A lot of people want to find out more info, so contact him. He does have a great string course, which we can link to as well. Um, I have access to it, but I haven't used it because I don't have a stringing machine here, but I've heard great things about it, and he is one of the best stringers out there, so recommend you checking that out. And big thanks to Keen, our moderator, and any other questions let me know and thank you very much bye yeah thanks thanks so much for having me this was fun and yeah i hope everybody enjoyed it and um yeah i hope to see you guys again soon great see y'all yeah. brilliant bye. thanks bye. guys bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.